on uh, um, Tuesdays when classes are in session. I believe this is the last one of the semester, actually. So after this, you guys go off and have a great uh, holiday. Um, and uh, uh, in grand tradition, we publicize in the Mountain View Weekly and uh, other places so that there are public here. Uh, there are faculty and their staff here. Uh, we draw from uh, speakers from, from all over the valley and beyond uh, from entrepreneurial and scientific venues all about um, talks on computing systems. Um, and when you when you're, um, uh, want to ask a question, I'm going to try. I think it's going to work out. Well, we might change that, but the lights on means that they're there. <clears throat> we will have um, people online, uh, and uh, we're lucky enough to be able to uh, get get uh, the authorization to put a lot of these talks online on TOCS. Uh, you just search for TOCS, and you'll be able to find find these talks and uh, point your friends to these wonderful talks that have been happening here. So today we're very lucky to have Alex Weibel. Uh, he is a world traveler and a helicopter pilot. But more than that, he's really uh, a, a real linchpin, a, a key, I don't know, key element in, in the way that uh, voice reco uh, is, uh, technology is being developed today. And um, he uh, has been a very important mentor to many of the people in, this, in, in the, our department, as well as started a company called Jibico. You can probably know all of these things and more. Uh, but in any case, thank you very much. And we're all looking forward to uh, hearing about this, uh, your, your work. Ted, thank you so much for inviting me to give this talk and also for your kind introduction. I uh, wanted to do um, a talk that sort of does a mix of things that begins with things that we've been doing for quite a while and some of you know about. And then uh, another one, uh, I think, my phone, okay. um, and then also give you a, um, a bit of an introduction to what, what's actually coming and what, what we're going to be doing in the, in the near future. Um, the problem is not solved. And that's why we say a new assault on the language divide. We always call it the language divide because much has been said about the digital divide. And we find that that's actually fairly straightforward. You know, in any uh, remote location in Indonesia and uh, in the jungles of uh, wherever, um, you know, you, you, you can barely get to it, but you will find cell phone towers and people talking busily on their cell phones. I can tell you lots of stories of going actually into the jungle in remote areas uh, in, in healthcare missions, and uh, you find that people uh, never had glasses to look and read anything, but they all have cell phones. You know, it's just almost uh, natural to do. And with that, of course, we, we have technology that they can now be deployed um, in, in, in the world. And uh, with the digital divide essentially not being so much of an issue anymore, the question is what really separates us? And it's really language more than anything else. And that's why we call it the link language divide. And we've been working on this for a while. And of course, the question is why um, it's clear that we're living in a global village at where um, we need to work together to uh, do trade and collaborate and for people to do business in, uh, in the world, they need to somehow interact on a global level. At the same time, we have cultural diversity. People talk, uh, talk in different languages and they're proud of their own cultures and communication doesn't necessarily come natural in a common language. So the challenge is how do we get one and, and the other, have our cake and eat it too? The question is, can technology provide um, an answer? So first of all, um, is the, the common answer to the problem is, let's all learn English. Let's force everybody to, to learn English. And indeed, you know, people make great efforts. But even in Europe, where, where you would say that people have actually spent a lot of time learning English and communicate rather well, if you go to a European scientific meetings, um, it's always going to be in English. But if you look closely under the hood, it's, it's clear that even there, the common language English is a myth. It's only less than 40% on average in Europe who speak English well enough that they can actually conduct business with each other. And it varies a great deal, of course, between languages. You see that the Swedes, for example, do very well in English. And on the other side, not surprisingly, Eastern European countries have not been uh, as strong in their command <coughs> of English. 
So it's a questionable pro proposition, but it gets worse if you really look at the number of translators available and how much is actually the need of translation, then you realize that a ton of money is already being spent in Europe, 1.3 billion euros a year on translation services. And that's only just for 20, 23 languages in Europe. And if you go to the worldwide uh, stage, then there are eff effectively 6,000 languages currently. If you wanted to translate in every language direction, it'd be a daunting task. It'd be, be impossible to do by human effort. And, the, and that's only text. By voice, it, the situation gets worse. There are the conferences going on all the time. And almost all the conferences we attend are going to be in English. There's very little um, in terms of simultaneous translation. Very few of them are actually translated. YouTube generates every minute 13 hours of new video. And of course, television, lectures, meetings, uh, telephone conversations, travel, etc., all confront us with that same problem. So we've been working on a, for a while on these systems that we call speech-to-speech -speech translation systems. And in, in their most pure form, they have two directions. And they have effectively six components. You need to have a speech recognition system in one language that recognizes what a person says. And you need to translate that resulting text from one language to the other, and then synthesize this in audible form on the other side in, uh, in, in the second language. If that other person is to respond, then you would get the inverse that the other person is, is responding in their language. You need another speech recognizer in their language, a translator from their language into your own, and then TTS or synthesis in your own language. So we need to always build these six components to build a speech-to-speech -speech translation system to make this work. And indeed, you know, we can do this. Today there are, in fact, systems. This is a, the, one of the typical graphs we show in terms of what it takes to build a system in translation. The speech side, the speech recognition, and the TTS side are similar. They, today they all get trained by data. Uh, automatically. So we have learning algorithms for pretty much every aspect of these systems. So where you effectively start with something uh, that comes in, in the case of machine translation, it's a source language text. There is some sort of pre-processing. And then there is a search that uses a translation model and a language model. Think of the translation model as a fancy dictionary with probabilities and multiple translations. And the language model, a model that tells you in what context certain words are plausible or appropriate. All of this is this oversimplification. There's, of course, lots of algorithms in there that make this better and improve the performance. But effectively, these are models that get statistically trained, and we use a ton of data to do so. And this is for machine translation, and the same is true for recognition and synthesis. We use similar systems. So that has advanced the field tremendously, also automatic evaluation systems, by which we can always test whether the systems work well. And uh, that has led to a progression of these speech translation uh, technologies. We started with domain-limited systems that were effectively only um, uh, uh, you know, systems to show feasibility in the uh, early 90s, late 80s, um, continued with domain-limited spontaneous speech translation systems in the 90s, and are now in, at a stage where there, you see es essentially two classes of systems. One is systems that are used in a domain-limited fashion, where we're using them as dialogue translators for field situations, and the other one, domain unlimited speech translators. I'll quickly walk you through some of the things that are going on in, in either of these. For a domain limited translation system, it is typically used in a, in a con consecutive translation mode. What we mean by that is you are meeting somebody, you want to say to them something, and you want them to respond to you. You want to carry a cross lingual carry out a cross-lingual dialogue. In that situation, you would say something, you, the translation is being produced audibly, that person can respond, and you then hear the translation of, of that output. And what that does is called consecutive translation, because you produce one or two sentences, and then you wait for the translation to be, to be sounded out. I mean, that's what a consecutive translator, human translator, would do. And then the response comes back. The, the sorts of systems are used and are deployed right now in humanitarian deployments. And so we're using them 
in lots of tests. Here you see some pictures from an exercise we do every year in Thailand called Cobra Gold. It's uh, where we, where US doctors and doctors from other countries in the region go into the field and provide free healthcare to the, the people there. And uh, you see that our translators are in the midst of it where an American doctor can then talk with a, a Thai nurse or with a Thai uh, patient uh, in order to negotiate or discuss what the problem is that they're trying to treat. This is um, obviously better than charts. I mean, people have been using in the past just charts to point to. The best, of course, is always to have a human translator, but they are, of course, always hard to come by. And uh, you see here actually a picture of a pretty, 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 uh, a complicated case where a Japanese doctor is using an electric dictionary to translate Japanese words into English words for, so that the Thai translator can take the English word and translate it to, or try to attempt to tell the Thai patient uh, what it is that the doctor wanted to say. So all of that screams for automation and, and technology. And so we have built systems that can do that and can do that in an offline mode too. So no network required in these systems. You can actually have them simply run on, uh, on a laptop but in the meantime also on a cell phone. When we got ready to do this on a cell phone or on a PDA, we started a company called Jibigo. You see here the, the um, description from the iTunes store. You can download these systems. They run in, uh, we work on 10 different languages. Uh, they are bi-directional, they go in both directions and uh, you can and, uh, handle 10 languages, as I said, Spanish, English, Japanese, Chinese, Arabic, etc. It covers a 40,000 word vocabulary and we offer two, um, you know, them to run on smartphones like the iPhone or on uh, iPads. Uh, and uh, again, one person can speak something into it, it recognizes it and translates it into the other language. I went to Spain after college and with my iPhone, I checked out hostels before booking them. Shared pictures as I went. My mom loved that. And I even downloaded this app, which became my personal translator. Where is the train station? All I really needed was my iPhone and my passport. So we were quite pleased that Apple ran commercials like this in, in the US, in Japan, in Australia, and uh, uh, in Canada. We got panicky calls uh, in the middle of the night that they wanted to do uh, the thing in, uh, in Australia and in Canada, and they didn't like the fact that we had a little US flag representing <laughs> English because the Canadians wanted a uh, Canadian flag, so we had to re-engineer the systems in a hurry, but it was still quite exciting to see that. We got quite a bit of uh, uh, mention and, uh, and Economist and New York Times uh, showed it. it. It became in Japan the number one selling app right after the launch. So it was quite a big success. And again, the key to its success was that it not only covers quite nicely the sorts of things you might want to say in a, uh, in a um, uh, travel situation, but it also runs offline entirely without the network. So if you're in another country, that's the first thing that goes off is the uh, the network connection because it's too expensive to pay the roaming charges and boy the military clearly doesn't want to transmit because in Afghanistan try to find a, uh, uh, a hotspot and if you could you didn't want to kind of reveal your transmission either. So again we offer this now on iTunes and Android App Store. Yes. Uh, just a question. So the system handles for example people's different accents okay in English or Yes, we were concerned, particularly in Australian, uh, yeah. Canadian, Native I hope there's no Canadians that, that, that feel insulted if I say that Canadian is like US English, but uh, by and large I think it's very close. Australian you hear quite a bit more accent, but we ran tests before that commercial came out and we're actually pleased that it adapted well enough to it that we didn't see a, a significant degradation in performance. So um, it does all these languages now. It's offered on the iTunes and Android. We, in the meantime, also have a free online version that runs over the net that people can download for free, try it out a little bit, and then if they want to be truly untethered, they can pay us $4.99 for the privilege of, of doing this for free. We think it's a bargain, particularly if you consider that 
Um, many of the research projects uh, uh, poured 20 million uh, or many millions of dollars into doing single language pairs. Here you see also the deployment of this in, in Honduras. That's another um, uh, charitable activity that we're supporting. Now on to unlimited domain uh, translation. So here what we want to do is translate not only the situation of a dialogue, but we would like to be able to apply all of this to different tasks, namely translation of broadcast news, for example, or translation of lectures and speeches, parliamentary speeches, telephone conversations, and so on. So um, this is one of the, can you? Can you? And, um, and ultimately also meetings. So one of the things that we're trying to do here is then to uh, do this in a situation where the domain is not necessarily limited and we want to do that simultaneously while the speaker is talking. So we started doing this um, with a project called TC Star where we worked on um, the databases of the European uh, Community, the Commission. There's lots of data available that comes from the parliamentary speeches in the European Parliament. And that led to uh, systems that can do this effectively simultaneously or at least in continuous speech. Now note that if you try to translate a lecture versus individual sentences, you don't know where the sentences begin and where they end. They continuously go and it's of course more disfluent. It's more um, noisy. I mean people say ahs and ums in the middle of their talk and it's producing um, speech continuously. So in this type of situation, we have to be, first of all, in real time. It has to go quickly. And secondly, we have to do this robustly for speakers uh, in large vocabularies. So without boring you with the detail, uh, progress was made in TC Star in this project with the European Parliament lectures. And the most intriguing slide to me was this one, where we found that in the end, when you ask people based on translations that were done by machine <coughs> on European Parliament lectures here in the, on the right, if you ask them questions about the content, they could answer these questions correctly in 74% of the time if a human simultaneous translator did the translation. <clears throat> and they did 62% uh, correct if the machine was doing the translation. Now what's striking is that the difference isn't so huge anymore. It's actually surprisingly good that, uh, that we can do this by machine getting close to the uh, human performance. Now the other thing that surprised me is why is the human performance not 100%? Why is it 74%, which struck me as, as, um, as actually quite poor? And we found that it's because people can't keep up with the speed of a lecture when they do simultaneous translation. Simultaneous translation is a very hard task. The, a human has to think about the sentences to be, that are to be translated. And then doing this in real time while memorizing this in their, or processing that in their mind. So the biggest problem of simultaneous translation for a human is a cognitive limitation that we can't keep that much in our head. While by contrast, this, the machine is only limited by the translation errors it makes, not by the amount of processing you can throw at it. So I would actually, right now and right here, predict the day will come where we can do this at superhuman performance, simply because we don't have that cognitive limitation in, in the systems we build. So with that thought in mind, um, let me go look a little bit towards the future. Where are we now and have we solved this problem? By the way, what's going around, I don't know if it's working well, but it's working great. Yep, we have, ago, we have a system here that runs on my laptop that does the continuous uh, transcription of what I'm saying here to you. This text of my lecture is being automatically recognized on my laptop and then sent via the internet to a server that we have running here in Silicon Valley, as well as in Germany, and that server then translates it into different languages. Now the students in the lecture can then pull out their personal device, point that to the URL of our uh, server, and then get the translation into Spanish or the <coughs> translation into another language that they may choose. So you see the, the PDA, or the rather, sorry, the uh, iPad that I'm uh, passing through uh, is a, an iPad that is uh, sent, being sent, sorry, that is pointing to the translation server and is set to a translation into Spanish. 
On that iPad, you can also then switch it to different languages. So the other languages don't work as well as Spanish, I might warn you. But in principle, it's possible to now get different output for each one of the listeners in the audience. So we have the situation where then different people can sit in an audience or sit in, an, uh, in a um, lecture and listen to the lecture or read the translation of the lecture in different languages. Yes. A couple of related questions. What's the word error? That, how is it affected by okay, I'll get to that. Fact. Thank you for asking that question. From the audience, what I saw is I watched it for about three minutes, and I got three errors out of probably 500 words. Yeah, I so shocked. I think the error rate on something like this is in the, in um, on my lectures, we allow the system to adapt, of course, to a voice, and that's, of course, the, Part of the secret sauce is that you let the system get accustomed to a particular user, and um, then the error rates can be below 10%. We believe that it requires 15% or less error rate for speech translation to make sense. If it's higher than that, you get too many mistakes that then get confusing. Yes? Is this using uh, commercial speech recognition? No, it's all our own. So um, actually, we have both speech recognition and translation engines at uh, CMU in Karlsruhe, and then speech recognition and translation engines at the company Jibigo. And so we, we have plenty of um, machinery there to do it. So is the problem solved? Are we done with the language divide? And unfortunately, the answer is clearly a uh, resounding no. And I will tell you what some of these limiting issues are that keep us from doing this in, in the world at large. It's, it's roughly these six points, and I will talk a little bit what we're doing um, to address them. First of all, performance. Uh, getting better speech recognition accuracy and better translation accuracy <coughs> continues to be a worry. We must drive, the, drive, drive down the error rate of these systems in order to do this more reliably. We have issues with human factors. Uh, again, doing this through a computer is, of course, a unusual thing to be doing. And we need to somehow introduce this technology in such a way that it doesn't become a hindrance in itself. We want people to be able to um, simply listen to a talk or converse with a person and have that language difference become transparent, it go away essentially, so that it becomes as natural as it is to talk with someone else in, a, uh, in one language. Another problem is adaptation and customization. Once again, um, the system that you see here, we've worked on this for a while, so it's of course been doing particularly well for my lectures and uh, for the typical lectures of computer scientists. But if you wanted to give this to different people, uh, it has to work well for different speakers. It has to work well for different topics. And whenever you do this, it becomes an issue because performance then degrades when, when that doesn't comply with the assumptions you're making. Language portability, a huge problem, and I'll say more about this. Doing this not just in one or two languages, but in 6,000 languages of the world is a tremendous problem. Error recovery and maintenance. It is human to err. We can all make mistakes. And one of the most amazing abilities of a human is to recover from these errors. Our systems are just rudely going through these errors, spit out confidently trash, and uh, will just shrug their shoulders and do whatever they do. A human is very good at knowing when they can't do a particular task and respond and handle the, re the, the error and recover from it. So there's none of that really currently in our systems. And then, of course, how do we all integrate that in actual practical services? Oh, and let me not mention, forget the last point. It takes money, of course. And this is, of course, a big challenge. And the question is, how does it all get paid for? So let me start with that point and say a word about cost. Now, traditionally, it has cost between $500,000 and $20 million to do a speech translator in a particular language pair. Why so large and why such a big difference? It very much depends also on the languages you're dealing with. If it is a language that is currently, for example, not even an orthographic language, the majority of languages in the world is not even written. People don't read and write. I'm sorry? Is that what I said? Meaning a, a language that has an orthography, a language that has text. 
many languages are uh, just simply spoken, but there's nobody who writes it. And, and in fact, dialects or accents um, are a version of that. So when we went to Iraqi, for example, Iraqi is a language that is spoken on the streets of Iraq, but it's not written. When people read and write, it's more than standard Arabic, and when they listen to TV, it's MSA or Egyptian or something else, but it's not Iraqi typically. And so these accents and dialects present a huge problem, but then, of course, there are simply many languages in the world. I think in India there are 300 languages, and the majority of them are, are not written. And so, again, how do you address those? <coughs> By doing it in a traditional way, what we have to do is, of course, to invent an orthography. We have to write down what the person said in terms of text, collect a lot of data, build a speech recognizer, build a translator. And that, of course, costs a lot of money. And that's why it's then driving the cost so enormously high if you want to do that. Because at this rate, it is possible to do this only for a few languages. So I joke always that it's the WMD that gets addressed, the wealthy, the many, and the dangerous. So whenever there are many people in a country speaking the same language, or there are rich people in a country speaking a language, or a similar language is perceived as a communication tool that is perceived as dangerous, then in those cases there will be money to be found that lets you pay those kinds of bills to, to build a translator. But that's, of course, usually eliminates the use of humanitarian um, missions because there is usually not as much money to be spent. So we're keenly concerned with uh, addressing these cost factors too, how to make it cheaper and how to port it faster to new languages. So speech data collection is, of course, a big issue here, translation data co collection and model training integra integration testing and then continuing basic research where all this money is going. So what do we do? We are actually quite pleased that we have two ongoing projects that fund us for this. There's, a, first of all, a, a German-French cooperation called Quero that allows us to opt, build better systems for recognition and translation, particularly in European languages. We also has a, have a strategic project that is funded by the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology for building lecture translation systems. A German university as good as it may be, always feels the pinch of the handicap of language because people like to go to, to universities where English is spoken simply because they don't then have to learn multiple languages. Nevertheless, um, uh, universities in Europe can be outstanding technically, and so there's a desire of helping with, with such tools to overcome the language barrier. We also are just about launching three large new efforts. One is an integrated project called UBridge uh, that involves many partners in Europe to deal with European languages, and Radical, a project in the US uh, to deal with affordability, and Bold, a DARPA program that deals with interaction of uh, um, an error repair. So what are we trying to do on a lecture translation today? So what you see here with the um, device that I'm passing around, you see a demonstration of what that could be like in the future. But the system that you see, as impressive we think it is by, by doing this in real time and doing it reasonably well that you understand the output, it is still fairly well tuned or uh, tuned and adapted to my language uh, and my speech and my topics. And what we need to do is make it generally available and uh, provide it as a service in order to make it available to uh, in an educational institution. So we're currently working in Germany on a German-English lecture translation system from German to English, so that in the future, if I give this lecture to you in German, you would have no problem to follow along. Yes. Well, I'll get into it, but it's clearly not compute power. <coughs> we can run this on a zillion servers, if you please, and um, the speed is really not the problem, and also the computation is not the problem. And indeed, you're right, we're counting on more and more power to, to come along. Um, but let me get into the issue, because that's what, what's got, what the rest of my talk is going to be about, to, to um, identify those issues. 
just a quick commercial, uh, since we're half time, a commercial break. We have an international workshop on spoken language translation happening right here in San Francisco. It's going to be on Thursday and Friday called IWSLT. For those of you who have not signed up to come, please do so. It's going to be a interesting workshop and particularly we, we are going to focus on lecture translation on this conference as well. There's been an evaluation and a bake-off that has been run and so you will hear the, about the results of that um, in this workshop. So what the lecture of the future will be like is just like the lecture I'm giving to you, except that a person's speech will be translated. Now, that the question, of course, first of all, is the delivery. How do you deliver this in such a way that people can listen to it privately? If I displayed here the translated text on the screen, it would be a distraction because you want to listen to the lecture, not constantly read text on the screen. Plus, it would be impractical to do that in 10 different languages if I had to project 10 different output texts on the wall. So there are three solutions that we have. One is what you're seeing here on the iPad, that each person can have their personal device and simply point it to the server and get the output as text. There's other ways of doing this. You know, we have experimented, and we have actually here in the building, a certain directional audio technology. It's an audio speaker that generates an audio beam that is only audible in a certain region of the, of the room. So we could be giving this lecture here um, in English, and then there might be a Spanish corner and a Chinese corner and a Russian corner where you, where you hear the translation simultaneously coming out of those speakers. And it's actually a quite impressive device <clears throat> where you really hear nothing if you're outside of that cone, and we always have great fun scaring people with it, actually. You can have heads-up display goggles. So imagine in the future you put these on, you have translation being beamed into your eyes, and so you see subtitles under the faces of people you're talking to uh, as if they are, you know, translation goggles, as if they're talking uh, on TV with subtitles. Now, if you had all this, I think the meeting of the future will become reality, and I think that will soon happen, I'm sure. Uh, many groups are interested in this and working that, on that, but again, eventually we'll be, be able to sit in a, in a room, each one of us talking in our own languages, and each one of us hearing it in our own languages or seeing the output text. Now, um, why is it still hard and not available? So first of all, speech and language is a hard problem. For those of you who don't know, it's, it's basically difficult because language is ambiguous. And with that, of course, we have many performance issues, but for lecture translation, we have, in addition, issues of special domains and, um, and ill-formed uh, speech from disfluencies, and that it all has to be done in real time. Just to point out for you how critical some of those problems are, this is a slide that is not necessarily completely up to date anymore, but qualitatively is still the issue. If you take it today's modern standard speech recognition system, and you try to make it recognize anchor speech of broadcast news, you can get 4% error rates or less. And if you take that now into um, more conversational uh, things, like uh, the show Crossfire, or you take it into meetings, uh, all of this becomes harder so that the error rates increase. And it's particularly bad if your microphone isn't directly in front of you as a close speaking microphone, but you have a microphone somewhere in the room. It's just very hard for humans to understand because when we do this with a close speaking microphone or a distant microphone, or if you're reading text or you're speaking it disfluently, disfluently, it makes little difference to us in terms of recognition ability. For a machine, the error rates still vary between 4% and 50%, literally, and so it is still a very difficult problem to address. I've been working on that, so I can't help but uh, show a few bragging slides. Uh, we uh, participate in these benchmarks, both on translation and recognition. These benchmarks have been a tremendous asset to the community because the same data is being used by multiple groups. Everybody builds their best algorithms, and then we measure and compare the different systems. These were different systems that were evaluated in the workshop for machine translation this year. And you see a number of these groups participating, and uh, I'm happy to say that the error rates of our translation system from uh, submitted by Karlsruhe in this, in this case, KIT, 
software integrated technology for several of these language di directions English, French, French, English, English, German, German, English. Uh, we did actually quite well or the best as, as we showed, we showed. So some of the researchers in the system are sitting here in the back row. They're actually with us this week for the IWSFT workshop. So uh, they can provide details later. Um, the Quero evaluation, similarly, very nice results that show that you can actually get error rates that, that uh, are very competitive. And in speech recognition also, here you see the German uh, error rates and Russian and Spanish from some of the uh, uh, systems that we have submitted. So again, this is sort of annual bake-offs where everybody uh, uh, flexes their muscles and tries to do the best they can. Usually these systems are not practical because they tend to be run on huge servers and uh, they take a long time to uh, run a single sentence because we try to eke out every half, half a percent of performance. In practice, of course, you wouldn't do that. If we go to lectures, uh, here is the translation from a lecture that was given in German by one of my colleagues. And I let you read it and see whether you can figure out. This was an automatic translation, but the transcription was done humanly. So there was no recognition errors in this case, but the translation was done by machine. It's actually quite remarkably good. You can really, if you read the translation, you can understand what this lecturer is talking about. But I let you read the first couple of lines and see whether you can figure out what's going on there. So you see he's actually beginning before doing the lecture, putting this microphone on and all these gobbly uh, little uh, fragments of a, of a sentence, they're all speech. They're all getting produced. They're all getting translated. And so again, one of the challenges you see right here is, is that what you want to read in translation? Or is, is there some more intelligent processing that is needed to make it in some sense a readable uh, output? So the issues, and the, now I get back to your question, is um, what are the limiting factors in performance? Oops. What's that? <laughs> My fault. I was ha I was about to blame it on technology again. All right. Human error. Um, okay, we got these issues, speaker dependence versus independence. That's still an issue because, again, in a lecture, for example, you can adapt, adapt aggressively to the speaker's voice. You typically get a long piece of speech from that speaker, so why not adapt to it? Noise, stress, shouting, singing, all this kind of strange language that we produce. We do that in lectures, but we certainly also do it in real life. And picking it up and uh, treating it appropriately is, is clearly an unsolved issue. Distant versus close microphones, a huge issue. As I said before, it makes the difference between 10% error rate and 40% error rate, depending on where you place the microphone. And it's, it's astonishing because we're so good at it, and to us, we're not even aware of the difference. Special topics and vocabularies and unknown words. Every lecture is presumably about a special topic. We don't typically, we hope, we don't give lectures about standard boring topics that everybody talks about, but about something substantial, of, of a substantial difference of a science, etc. So we will have different topics and different words, different uh, uh, vocabularies for those. Um, <laughs> quiet. <laughs> um, so what do we do? We um, have disfluencies in spontaneous speech. Disfluencies in spontaneous speech are, are, 
I would say, the second biggest problem that we have. If you take red speech, the error rates are 5%. To 10, 5%. If you take spontaneous speech, it sh shoots up to 30% or more. Uh, speaking style and genre, if your system is built for one style of speaking, let's say it's broadcast news, but you want to use it on lectures, or you want to use it on meetings, both the translation and the recognition will disappoint you. Now, if they were trained and built for this genre and speaking style, they will do much better. Now, then again, does that mean we have to build for each genre, topic, speaking style, and language a separate system for $20 million? We'll never solve the problem. So we've got to do this, this and make it more adaptive. So here's the issues for lecture translation that, that we're currently working on. So for example, special vocabularies. What do we do? This is a master's uh, thesis that is being worked on and, or completed by one of our students who is actually an exchange student, Interact exchange student, who's now in Silicon Valley, Paul Merkner. And he's worked on um, this issue of uh, recognizing sentences and then adapting them to the lecturer so that words that were not in your vocabulary can automatically be added to the system. We know we can do that by hand, but if, you, if I give the, the same system to somebody else, I want that adaptation to happen automatically. So here you see something where you say, today I will talk about Newton's second law, the genetics of particles. Now if you know that this is something about physics, and maybe if you've seen the PowerPoint slides of the, of the speaker, perhaps you could predict that it should be Newton's. Foreign words, we find that actually many lectures contain a, a healthy amount of foreign words, particularly non-English ones. And English uh, lectures tend to be peppered with English terms. So in the German computer science lecture, we discovered that the word laser, uh, is, because it's pronounced in an English way in German as well, uh, is, is then recognized as laser, which means the reader of something. And, uh, and the typical pronunciation rules of German would pronounce laser as laser, but nobody says laser in German. Everybody says laser. And there are certain meanings that are unusual in each language. You have something like Klausur, which usually means retreat, but if you say it in a lecture, it usually means the final exam. The final exam is called a Klausur. And then if we t take data from the German Landtag, which is the, uh, the parliament in Baden-Württemberg, um, then uh, you find that politicians, in order to sound very well-educated, pepper their lectures with Latin proverbs and Again, Latin was not part of our vocabulary either. So um, third issue, disfluencies in spontaneous speech, and uh, then these meta dialogues that I have mentioned before. So what do we do about the first problem? The first problem, again, this is work by uh, Paul Merkner and, and colleagues. Uh, what we do here is the words in the vocabulary have to be in the vocabulary of the recognizer, in the language model of the recognizer, the translation model and the language model of the translator. The question is how do we automatically get these words so we don't have to diddle with it every time somebody gives a lecture in another domain. So what Paul Merkner is doing and he's uh, publishing this now at IWSLT is the idea is as follows. You take a, uh, material from the lecturer like the PowerPoint slides or the publications of that lecturer you take all of that material, run a web search over the internet, and you find all kinds of documents that are somewhat related to this, to this topic, to this domain. And from those words, you extract all the new words, and from, for these new words, you automatically generate pronunciations uh, by pronunciation rules, and you insert then that word into the vocabulary and you iterate. When you do that, you actually dramatically reduce the out of vocabulary rate, and this is the rate of words that are not in the vocabulary. And again, bear in mind that each one of those words that's not in the vocabulary tends to produce 1.5 errors for each unknown word. And then when that word is not recognized correctly, it gets, of course, translated into something bogus in the other language and generates a lot of confusion. So dealing with these unknown words is a critical part. Now, the other big problem that I wanted to still say a word or two about is that long tail of language. As I was joking before, this is 
a big issue. We're only addressing a few languages that we can afford to work on. And this is a distribution of the languages of the world. And you see it doesn't take very long to get to languages that nobody is really researching very actively and where certainly there's no speech translation systems. And again, for, for, for us to deal with them and do them, we have to dramatically reduce the cost of uh, uh, production of, of such systems. Now, I want to, when we're talking about this and saying, you know, well, does it only take, you know, what does it take to build a system? And of course, as scientists, we, li we like to think that the biggest factor and the most important thing that we do is the development of fancy new algorithms that improve the error rates and the translation error rates. But the two little dirty se little secrets that nobody is willing to tell you in a conference is that really there's nothing that helps your performance more than just simply collecting more data. And then the second one is to clean that data. So you get tremendous improvements just if, you, if someone humanly goes in and fixes all the typos and uh, corrects the pronunciation uh, rules, et cetera, et cetera. And so this is, of course, disconcerting because we, we pride ourselves for doing everything automatically and then we have to do quite, quite boring tasks expensively uh, over a long time. So we're addressing this issue now also, or looking at this issue, uh, through a project that uh, was just approved. Um, it's, it's doing that not in the context of speech translation, but looking at portability of speech recognition in the co context of spoken term detection. Spoken term detection is not quite as difficult as translation because there what you just want to do is retrieve a document, a spoken document, based on a query. And with such a system in mind, what we're trying to do is build these systems rapidly so they can be used and deployed in, uh, in many languages quickly. What we'd like to achieve is, in fact, uh, an improvement in the development time. You see here, this is actual data and the other is just a pipe dream. So what you see here is what the time it takes us to do speech translators, or the speech recognition engines for a translator, once you have the data for a resource poor language and for a resource rich language. Now, if I give you all the data and we say we have automatic learning uh, approaches, why does it take, oops, what do I do? Let me continue in words while I'm, while I'm talking here. Um, so what, what we like to answer is, um, I just so the, so if you have all the data that it takes to train a system like this, why would it, why wouldn't, why would you not be able to do that in an afternoon? Or like your question, uh, is it just limited by the 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 amount, of, the amount of machines that we have at its disposal? That's not the issue. We could do this all in a day or two days, train an entire system, if the data was appropriate and we had enough of it right there and right then. So if you really look at this curve of why it's taking us 11 months to build a system or for a resource rich languages, maybe a little little less, then the answer is it's, it's so happening because the data is um, either has errors in it, typos, um, you know, inconsistencies, mistakes, bugs, and has to be cleaned, and we may not have enough of it. So again, uh, collecting this data more cheaply and then of, uh, also uh, using it in the, in the context of a system more intelligently is one of those big issues. Yes. Um, a few, I'd say a few months ago, we had a talk from someone who was speech recognition at Google, and uh, it was Mike Schuster. One of the points that he mentioned was that uh, they use a lot of unsupervised training data, uh, partially for privacy reasons, right? Mm -hmm. And he showed, I think it was a factor of four, right? I think it was if you had four times as much unsupervised data, you get the same increase in yes, recognition that's accuracy true. as if you had. There was an Is there a similar thing for the translation? Um, well, first, um, well, first of all, let me let me respond to the uh, recognition side of this question. Uh, 
there was a similar experiment run by BBN about 10 years ago, and they also found, in their case, they, their answer was 10 times as much data. And it is true that if you have that much more data, you can get improvement simply by unsupervised adaptation. Now, the problem is 10 times as much data when we are already talking about the amounts of data that a 20-year-old hasn't heard in his lifetime, right? I mean, to train a modern language model uh, takes more data than a 20-year-old has seen in his lifetime. Something's broken, right? And you cannot, and you cannot expect every language in the world to have that much data on, uh, even on the internet, right? So that's okay when you're doing Chinese, Spanish, and English, but if you're doing some weird language in, in, in some uh, remote location, um, that's not possible. And then it costs you, right? Um, in translation, it's of course harder because in translation you always require a parallel corpus. So you need somebody who has translated this. Um, well, since I'm at the conclusion, let me continue with answering something that we have done in the context of, of that is Yeah, I'm Another done. Meeting. And, and uh, what we do is we serve cookies and soda outside. So uh -huh. we can take one question or we can just move outside to the question. Oh, okay, like. thank you very much. So I'm done with the talk anyway and I'm answering the first question. <laughs> 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 so one thing that we, we, we constantly worry about this. So we're thinking about techniques both in translation and uh, recognition. How you can do this with much less data, for example, more parsimoniously and then how you can collect the data more cheaply. So uh, various PhD theses at our lab have been done in this, in, in this context. Matthias Eck, for example, did his thesis on showing that you can work with a third of the data and get the same performance as three times as much data by just being more clever in, in what kind of data you, ch you choose. Another trick, for example, that another PhD thesis has come up with is to say, suppose we are skipping um, text altogether. And you sometimes find a speaker who speaks both languages and might be willing to translate a, a native speaker into English for a while verbally right, by recording both of them doing this. Can we learn and train these systems? Can we bootstrap them by uh, listening to the, the parallel speech, as it were? That too is actually possible to a degree and again gives us performance improvements with, le with more limited data. And so there's a host of things in that in this family of ideas where we can actually make progress. Yeah. When you're training the system, how much context do you try to optimize? Like a, a five word, ten word paragraph, a whole conversation? <coughs> yeah, in fact, it's another dirty little secret. It's, it's, uh, it's very hard to beat the trigram, and the trigram effectively only gives you a three-word context. And when you have lots of data, Google-sized data, you go up to four grams and five grams, but that's where it effect essentially stops. And, and um, what you'd really like to do is have much broader context and look at, for example, the context of the whole lecture, for example, a conversation. So there, too, we're trying to take a completely different look, not only look at language modeling in the, in the close context, but really bias the whole system for a different topic, let's say, or a different domain. And so there are different uh, ideas going on in, in, in this regard. I don't know if that answers your question, but, um, but it's tricky to make it improve because you need to know exactly what context to pick. It's the combinatorics in, in all generality that kills you because if you want to have statistics for all possible contexts more than five words in the past, you need uh, too much data. So you need to have a better way of biasing the system for a particular topic. Co-occurrence statistics, trigger pairs, there are some ideas along those lines that, uh, that are being tried and they do help to some degree. Um, so the last 10 years, even 15 years, has been about statistics. It's almost yeah. more important than all, everything else, statistics and data. Is there, uh, an, will that continue and always be the, uh, the mathematics of, of improvement here, or is there what, what, what will be a next tool? I think it's a good question. I'm not sure I want to even call it only statistics, but I think it's about learning, right? I think 
learning, yeah, there I would say it's always going to be about learning. Whether we do that by statistics or neural nets or what have you, I'm sure there, there can be lots of ways of implementing machine learning mechanisms, but clearly the only <coughs> existence proof otherwise is a learning machine or a learning system, which is us as humans. And the complexities of the task are such that I think it can only be handled by clever learning approaches. Now, will there be statistical, et cetera, and will we have new models? So I think the improvements will come from better modeling. So in terms of models, for example, one area in translation that is severely lacking is semantics, right? So the systems we're building just use the context, but they don't use the, the semantics of, of what we know about the world. And in translation, that hurts. Another thing, for example, in terms of context that we're not using is anything that we as a human also know. You know that the person you're talking to is male or female, for example. Well, it turns out in Thailand or in Spanish, it matters whether you're female or male depending on how you translate or use the sentence. So if you use the wrong gender in translation, it's odd. Um, formal status, I see friends from who wear shared years in Japan, you know, you don't address the emperor with the same language that you address a uh, colleague at work or your own family. So social status makes a lot of difference in the terms of language that you use. And again, how do you introduce this to the system if you don't really involve a lot of info, uh, other contextual information? Okay. So the formal part is finished. Thank you. Well, yeah, you always do need to.